So within the tech industry, contrition is in. Over the last 12, 18, 24 months, this industry that's been renowned for its optimism about the future, well, that started to shift. We've now had a creeping recognition, I think, that the industry has started to go the wrong way. Just as promised, technologists have moved fast and broken many things. And the founders and influencers within this world, who previously talked about technology as almost an unalloyed good in the world, are now writing remorseful medium posts. They're forming non-profits to express their concern about the direction that we've taken, and they're begging for a second chance. There's now an unprecedented focus and an overdue focus, frankly, on the harms that technology can do. The press is as likely to call technology a, a, a danger as it is a savior. And that's understandable because we keep serving up these easy examples. Microsoft Tay, the racist chatbot, Facebook's emotional contagion study in which they tried to change the mood of 689,000 people without consent. Twitter, um, with its ongoing failing, failings to grapple with abuse on its platform. And of course, Uber, which was for a long time its own corporate soap opera of ethical challenge, shall we say. And there's now some, effect, uh, some evidence that that's having an effect on how the public views the tech industry. Dot Everyone, who are a think tank based in London, they uh, poll the public on attitudes to technology, and they found that 50% of respondents said that technology had made their lives better. It's a pretty good number. Only 12%, however, said that tech had a very positive impact on society itself. <clears throat> and so for me, that's a worrying trend, because over the next 10, 15, 20 years, the technology community is going to demand an enormous amount of trust from its users. We're going to ask people to connect more and more of their lives to the products and the services that we build. We're going to ask them to trust us with their homes, their vehicles, even the safety of their families. The potential harms that are implied and contained within emerging technology far outdo those even in today's technology. The stakes will only get higher with time. So this has been my focus now for the last two or three years. So in this talk today, I'd like to discuss and highlight the ethical challenges inherent in today's and tomorrow's technologies, but then also talk specifically about how we as current and emerging future practitioners can grapple with some of those ethical challenges. I'll start with data ethics, which have become um, you know, a fairly prominent uh, case study, if you like, for some of the, the challenges the industry is facing. Something very interesting has happened with data and the way that we talk about data, the language that we use. Previously, until maybe a couple of years ago, we used to use the language of the library when we talked about data. Data was catalogued, stored, it was referenced, it was queried. But we no longer talk about data in that way. Instead, a new metaphor has taken its place. Data is the new oil. And that's a revealing metaphor in many ways. It suggests that data is something that we now burn for profit. And it suggests or it um, implies that data has become an unstoppable natural force, a liquid, a torrent, a deluge. It's no accident, of course, that liquids have a habit of leaking. And now data has become central to pretty much any technological endeavour. I think sometimes it's tempting to over-focus on the advertising use case for data. There's a lot of discourse that centers on the ethics of advertising uh, in technology and the data requirements of that. But any company is really now incentivized to gather information on use and on their users. Analytics is critical to most companies now to understand how their products and services are having an effect in the marketplace, how they're changing behaviors. And of course, data is particularly useful for artificial intelligence, for training. Without AI, there simply is no, uh, without data rather, there simply is no AI. And so companies, authorities, governments alike are now incentivized to create vast reserves of data on the habits of the citizens and users within their systems. And to an extent, those communities of citizens and consumers are themselves now interchangeable. Uh, under the right legal and technical circumstances, data available to a company will also be made available to a government. Autonomous vehicles, for an example, will, give, um, will create up to something like four terabytes of data a day, a vast amount of data from these mobile clusters of sensors and cameras and LiDAR that they, that they will have. This data will be, of course, invaluable to the manufacturers, 
the software companies behind these vehicles so they can understand are they operating correctly and how can they be tweaked to work more efficiently. But this same data will also be invaluable to the police to investigate road traffic accidents and potentially all sorts of crimes on the street um, that have nothing to do with road traffic accidents themselves. This uh, increase of power that comes with uh, having these mobile uh, sensory apparatuses um, prompted The Economist magazine, who are hardly opponents of corporate power or of technological progress, to label autonomous vehicles panopticons on wheels. A lot of the ethical impact, I think, that surrounds data comes from its invisibility and also stems from um, kind of some of the attitudes and the precepts that we believe in as designers, as people following the ideas of user centricity. The famous book, uh, by Steve Krug called Don't Make Me Think, really talks about the idea of treating um, some things as, as complexity that's best hidden from the user, and I think data is one of them. Designers have chosen to treat data flows as something that shouldn't really be seen by users, that don't need to be exposed. We've decided that users have no business really peering under the hood to see what's happening within these systems. And so we have now a perfect storm, I think where we have a host of new sensors in our urban environments and within our devices. We have data pouring invisibly between these cooperating systems. And we have companies and authorities incentivized to gather as much as they can. This is therefore a potential breeding ground for unethical behavior. Data, of course, then fuels algorithms. Algorithmic bias has become uh, over the last couple of years, a, a much more familiar topic than it has in the past, largely thanks to ProPublica's investigation into the Compass crime prediction algorithm, which found that, uh, or claimed that, black people would be more likely to be future offenders than white people. But we've known about algorithmic bias since the 1980s. Uh, a medical school in the United Kingdom built an algorithm to process job applications and eventually found that it was biased against women and people with non-European sounding names. This was quite a big deal at the time. I think the British Medical Journal ended up uh, publishing a piece about it and calling it a blot on the profession. And yet it's only recently that we've almost rediscovered this as a community. The idea of algorithmic bias can be quite tough to tackle within tech firms because there's a perception that algorithms are clean and objective and neutral. But of course, that's not the case. Professor Jeffrey Bowker coined a, a memorable uh, phrase, raw data is an oxymoron. All data and all algorithms carry the implicit bias of the people and the cultures that make them. You can't separate data from its means of collection and presentation. You can't separate uh, analytical algorithms from their processes and their manufacturers and the uh, systems that they use. Here we see as a graphic uh, a tremendous piece of in information design, I think, by a, a, a chap called Simon Scar. This is for the South China Morning Post. And clearly it depicts the impacts of the Iraq conflict. And Scar has chosen a very obvious metaphor, a leading metaphor, a biasing metaphor, intentionally to bring home the scale of the conflict. Obviously the metaphor here, you know, literally or metaphorically drips from the page. On the right now, we see Andy Cockgrave's uh, attempt to change the meaning of this data with the same, the very same raw data, but by making simply three changes, by changing the hue, by changing the headline, and then inverting it on the y-axis, I suppose it would be, Cockgrave completely reverses the meaning of the same data set. And meanwhile, algorithms are being increasingly entwined in critical human decisions sentencing, jobs, hiring, firing, promotions, access to public services, and so on. The smart city itself is predicated upon the idea of sensing what's happening within our environments, and then using though, that data to fuel algorithms to respond. We have things like ShotSpotter, used in the US to listen for gunfire uh, within urban centers. We have facial recognition technology, um, which is increasing in power each year, and within a couple of years, perhaps, will be possibly used to track people's movements through an entire city and to also find out their personal associations. Who do they hang out with the most in what areas? So combine this deep data harvesting with unquestioned and opaque algorithmic decisions 
and you have, in the words of Zeynep Tufecki, the building blocks of authoritarianism. Technologies are also powerfully persuasive. All technologies are persuasive, but sometimes that's become an explicit focus of the industry. Mostly this centers on the idea of nudging people toward healthier living. You know, we have Fitbits that try to motivate us to go out and take uh, you know, the active life. We have um, health, health apps, diet tracking apps and so on that will try and tempt us away from the burger and toward the salad. But of course there are other uses, other uses for all of these persuasive um, potentials, if you like. And so we have what's bordering on a moral panic right now about addictive technology, technology that has trained the users to keep coming back for more. Now, to my understanding, I don't think tech addiction and social media addiction is actually yet evidenced as a separate uh, disorder, but it's clear that there is some particularly trashy use of technology out there that's resulted from this persuasive mentality, this chasing of certain engagement metrics. But the greater concern for me is what comes next. Uh, Karen Young, who's a, a legal scholar in London, she talks about a persuasive system that is dynamic, able to change its approaches based on what works and what doesn't for you. It's networked so it can learn not only from you, but from millions of other uh, persuasive subjects. And it's deeply personalized, so it has access to the data that we've discussed previously. And so it knows which buttons it, push, it can push within you. That system, a hypernudge system, as Jung calls it, could be an irresistible force of manipulation. And so this suggests some quite deep ethical questions. At what point, for example, does a, a nudge become a shove? When does this start to undermine our free will, our autonomy? And again, if this happens invisibly, doesn't that create some kind of power imbalance? Will people be able to recognise that this is happening? Can they collectivise against it? Can they protest? Will they understand who's trying to manipulate their behaviour for what ends? We also have, I think, some significant challenges around the ethics of sustainability and the environmental impact of our work. Victor Papanek, who was a, an industrial designer, wrote a book called Design for the Real World. And it opens with this memorable line, uh, which of course I now have to remember. <laughs> um, there are professions more harmful than industrial design, but only a very few of them. It's a great line, but when I say it to digital people, you know, people working in software and tech, a lot of the time I get a response saying, oh, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's powerful, but we're sort of off the hook here, right? We're not the ones wrapping things in plastic and piling them high and selling them cheap. To which my response is, we should look at, say, what happens with the Volkswagen scandal. Their emissions scandal was a pure software cheat. Within the existing architecture of the engine, they simply put a software hack in to cheat emissions tests, creating undeclared emissions that will kill, by some estimates, hundreds of people. Increasingly, every device is tending toward having a chip in it, some kind of smart sensor array. Uh, so, of course, there's this hybridization of the physical and digital worlds. Software is very much heating the world. Crypto mining, for instance, the Bitcoin <laughs> network now uses, well, I've been tracking energy use of this for a little while. It was using the same amount of energy as Paraguay, and it was Iceland, it's now Austria. It currently uses 0.33% of all en uh, electricity in the world. And the upgrade cycles of consumer tech are enormously aggressive. Think of all the handsets or tablets or laptops that you've owned even in the last five to 10 years. Where are they now? Do you still have them all? What's happened with the rare earth minerals that were mined to create the LCDs, the gyroscopes, the sensors within these systems? Helen Walters is a design critic and writer, and she reviewed the CES uh, electronic show of, of 2011, I think it was. And she pointed out that she talked to a lot of designers who espoused the idea of sustainable innovation. Yet at CES, there were 20,000 new products unveiled, including 80 tablets. And Walter says, well, this isn't sustainable, nor is it innovation. It's vandalism. Are we comfortable with our roles in this change? Do we want to be these agents of obsolescence that we are becoming? I think we also have some tricky ethical questions to ask when we enter an era of machine autonomy. Some of our deepest held principles and processes, particularly the idea of user centricity and user centered design, start to go away because these technologies aren't about use. 
anymore. It's really about coexistence. The ethics of automation often bring up this um, hoary old topic of the trolley problem, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. You know the drill by now. Um, a thought experiment from philosophy from Philippa Foote, I think in 1967 perhaps. Um, do you pull a switch to redirect a runaway trolley to kill two people rather than three workers on the tracks? Do you push a fat man off the tracks to stop the trolley in the first place? Um, and it's, you know, as a thought experiment, it's fairly well known, but the theory goes that it becomes more real, becomes reified in the world of uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, MIT ran a study which they called Moral Machine, essentially crowdsourcing reactions to this, trying to understand how the general public thought an autonomous vehicle should react in those life or, life or death cases. But to be honest, it's something of a red herring. Andrew Chatham, who is a lead engineer on the Waymo project, says, you know, it takes the intrigue out of the problem, but the answer is you slam on the brakes. So for me, the trolley problem actually masks some deeper and more interesting moral challenges. How do we handle the dilution of responsibility that te technologies bring us? If one of these machines hits a cyclist, for example, we might look at whether the cyclist um, you know, rode out uh, with, without due uh, care or attention. We might ask whether the software was uh, poorly programmed or malfunctioning. Perhaps the driver still bore some responsibility in, if it was a, a semi-autonomous vehicle. Do we have to uh, reconfigure our views of liability, for instance, of these systems? Should we at some point choose to disable a vehicle if the user has chosen not to apply a firmware update? The moral machine study I mentioned found essentially that the general public wants to harm as few people as possible with these systems. They wanted systems that were governed by what's called a utilitarian uh, lens, which we'll come on to shortly. But subsequent to that, uh, a paper in Science uh, from Jean-Francois Bonnefort uh, actually found that no one wanted to buy those systems. Everyone liked the idea of a utilitarian vehicle that would minimise harm unless they were potentially the, the person at risk of harm. So there's an open question here. Will people actually want these truly moral machines if it has an impact on their own safety? Mercedes, for example, have already announced that in this situation, this theoretical decision of whether to harm a pedestrian or the driver, they will always harm the pedestrian. They will protect the driver at all costs. May not be that big a surprise coming from a company like Mercedes, but I can actually understand it in terms of that, that's a decision that they've taken to protect the one person that they have the most control over. And then, of course, there are questions about what we shouldn't automate. Uh, in 2016, the Dallas police uh, killed a suspect, Mike Xavier Johnson, ironically by rigging a bomb defusal robot with C4 explosive. And they piloted it over to him and blew him up in this, in this siege. Now, that was a drone. That wasn't an autonomous system. It was piloted remotely, as I say. But autonomy is going to creep into these systems. We have militaries all over the world now interested in lethal autonomous weapon systems. And even if you're not directly working on those projects as a technologist, a lot of the AI work that we do can be used for military purposes. So there are deep questions about where technologists choose to draw the line. And of course, there are significant potential impacts on the world of work. We're on the brink of the fourth industrial revolution. This was news to me. I'm, I'm no historian. I thought we were done with one. But uh, <laughs> what happened in those previous revolutions, of course, was that the world of work and manufacturing was transformed, but it ended up in a stable, steady state. The number of people in work remained roughly the same after each of the previous three. That may not hold this time, because the main difference here is this is no longer about physical automation, but cognitive automation. Any job, no matter its current status within the, uh, the marketplace, if you like, can be decomposed into tasks, many of which will be automatable. So it's possible we'll end up with a, a deeply two-tier uh, world of work, where we have jobs essentially above and below the API. The middle gets hollowed out and we have uh, a small number of people who are able to command the machines, who instruct and test and check the machines. And then we have a much larger group of people in precarious positions, in low-paid, low-status positions, who are essentially working, lifting, assembling, carrying at the behest of the algorithm. In that two-tier society, that could clearly deepen inequality. The influence of capital 
as opposed to labour, will only grow in that system unless we take some checks against it. If you own the means of production, well, that's enormously potent if you have the ability to produce pretty much anything. So there are all sorts of deep questions about the sort of future and the sort of economies that we want in a world of cognitive automation. I think the nightmare, the dystopia, is we end up in a world that's not yet post-work, but is fully post-worker. We expect people to still be paying their mortgage and working and being you know, salaried individuals, but we simply cannot perform as well as the machines. And then finally, of course, there are the sexy sci-fi questions about what happens when uh, artificial intelligence reaches some kind of comparable human level. Do ro will robots at some point deserve moral and legal rights of their own? Should we ascribe legal and moral personhood to artificial agents? If we do, then we have to consider, uh, reconsider perhaps the, the very idea of ownership. We have laws against owning people. That's something we call slavery. Will machines ever have consciousness? Is it ethical to build anthropomorphic machines? Does that set up a false expectation of the capabilities of these systems? And of course, that utterly seductive question, will they kill us all? Now, I think these are fascinating topics and they, of course they come up a lot, but I'm actually not gonna focus on them here. I think it's very easy to be distracted by these distant sci-fi threats to the expense of the more pressing issues in front of us today. I think what powerful and intelligent people do with technology is probably more of a danger than powerful intelligent technology. So for me, it's clear that there's fertile ethical ground for us to take these decisions seriously, to recognize the moral impacts of our work. That may sometimes be an unpopular message, of course, within industry. You know, it can be seen as a drag on innovation. It can be uh, seen as um, something needless and wasteful. We just want to uh, push the pedal of progress, I suppose. But I quite like the phrasing from Peter Paul Verbeek, who's a philosopher of technology in the Netherlands. He says that ethics should accompany technological progress. It doesn't have to necessarily oppose it. We can find ways to infuse it into our work. As a designer, I like thinking of ethics as a constraint. Now, I know as a designer that constraints, sure, they do reduce some options, but they also generate new options. Ethics can be a seed of innovation, not just a pair of shears. If that's going to happen, we have to come to the overdue realization that technology isn't neutral and frankly it never was. In 1980, Langdon Winner, philosopher, wrote a, a, a paper called uh, Do Artifacts Have Politics? And his conclusion was, well, yeah, damn right they do. He gave the example of Robert Moses. Robert Moses was the city planner of New York in, I think, the 20s and 30s. And Moses was a racist. We have ample evidence of his uh, racist views. And it's alleged, that it's a slightly disputed account, but it's alleged that he built bridges over the um, parkways toward Long Island beaches so low that buses couldn't travel beneath them. Minorities living in the city, particularly black residents, tended to travel more frequently by bus. So essentially, Moses had tried to racially segregate these areas through these hulking great big structures these inert hundreds of tons of steel and concrete. So if even a bridge can have moral impact, and of course uh, a technology can. Because it's a mistake to separate the capabilities of technologies and of humans. We act together as interwoven actors. Things change what people can do and how we do them. It is true to an extent that guns don't kill people, but they sure as hell make it a lot easier for people to kill people. So we have to get past this belief in neutrality, this belief that we can therefore wash our hands of the social and political and ethical responsibilities of our work. I'd go further and I'd say design is applied ethics. And sometimes that's a, you know, there's a fairly obvious relationship here. If you design razor wire, whether you realise it or not, you're making a statement that people's right to personal private property is so important that we should injure someone who chooses to contravene that right. But even if you're not making something so morally laden as razor wire or weapons, all acts of design involve making statements about the future. Whenever you design, you're making a claim for how we should live, how we should interact with technology in years to come. 
And at the same time, you're also discarding tens of thousands of alternative futures. There's a clear moral case within that in making a statement about how we should live as a society. Sadly, I think the industry tends to try to fall back on simple answers. Well, just don't work for you know, whoever your particular uh, bet noir is that, that week. Or just ban ad-funded technology. Or perhaps we just need some kind of Hippocratic oath for design or for technology. I'm particularly critical of that last one. Um, I would say, if another code of ethics is the answer, why haven't the previous 20 worked? But for me, probably the most important message is that we aren't the first on these shores. Technologists often like to believe, slightly arrogantly, that we are beta testing this ideal future. We're the ones trying to grapple with these deep issues for the first time. But of course, there are millennia of histories uh, and of um, insight into morality, ethics as a topic. There are decades of work in science and technology studies, in philosophy of technology. So we have contemporary academics, critical designers, philosophers, artists, writers who've been grappling with these questions for far longer, frankly, than we have. And they've done this fascinating deep work, but sadly they haven't really been taken that seriously within industry. I think the tech industry is deeply intelligent, but it's, it's strongly anti-intellectual. And I think it's time for that to change. We need to start learning from the academics and artists and thinkers who've grappled with these topics and then bring them into our own work. Ultimately, the success stage is we want ethics to become an ethos, a way that we approach our work and our world. But we also have to recognise that we need to take some concrete steps. I, I'm, I'm a little bit wary to suggest that ethics is something we should sort of inject into our process. Nevertheless, I'm going to focus on a few particular um, points in the design and product development process that we can focus on. So this is my oversimplification of the design process. Anyone who's a designer here, uh, forgive me for uh, this oversimplification. We know that it's, it's rather messier than this. But I think we can start right at the beginning of any project definition. When we're kicking off projects, we have to consider things like, who are the stakeholders that are part of our, our remit? Now, if you look at, say, business textbooks, they'll talk a lot about stakeholder analysis. Um, but they'll often focus on really just one category of stakeholders, people who can affect the project. But of course, there is a second class that often goes unheard, people whom the project can affect. And I think we've often overlooked these people. In the name of user-centered design, we focused very much on trying to fulfill the needs of the primary persona, the user, whoever that may be. Airbnb, I think, is a good example of this. Airbnb is a very well-designed product or service, whichever you call it, for two groups of people. For people who have property they wish to rent out, and people who are in a different city and want to rent a room or an apartment or something like that. It's a very well-designed system for those folks. Unfortunately, the costs of the system are paid by the local community. If you live next door to an Airbnb rental, you no longer have a neighbour. You have a new series of neighbours every couple of days dragging their damned wheeled, trolley, uh, wheeled bag, bags over the cobbles at 4am, that kind of stuff. They're not going to spend their money locally. They'll spend it in the tourist traps. They're not interested in living by the norms of your block or your neighbourhood. They will live by their own sets of rules. And so this individualistic focus, this quite narrow focus on serving the needs of the user, has caused us to overlook broader societies, broader ecologies. So we can, you know, we can attack this in a couple of ways. One of the things I have started doing is actually sort of offering a prompt list saying, should we consider a broader set of people as somehow implicated in our work? There might even be scope to add abstract concepts within this list. I would say, for instance, Facebook have found recently that their work has started to have an impact on and started to sort of pick at the seams of democracy or the freedom of the press. Maybe these things need to be regarded as stakeholders within our systems. I also like the idea of using what I call a persona non grata. This is a really simple thing. It's essentially an anti-persona, a dark persona, a persona noir, if you like. This is a bad actor within our system and we choose some way to expose them within the design studio, within the project team. And of course, our job here is to hamper this person. So we'll find out what are their motivations, what are their goals on our platform, and how do we work hard to dampen those, to contradict them. 
I'm also increasingly interested in the idea of what's called bias bracketing. This was something that was fairly new to me, um, something that's apparently now be become quite common in social sciences um, research, the idea of trying to explicitly list in advance all the ways in which bias might impact future research that you're about to undertake. And by doing so, you then also create notes as the research goes, at any moment you suspect bias could have an impact on your work. And then you can use that checklist essentially to evaluate your results, to say, is it possible that these existing sources of bias have caused me to come to the wrong conclusions? I'd like to see the tech industry do more of this kind of thing. When it comes to the ideas generation phase, of design, um, and particularly looking at the ethical implications, we need to rely on what's called moral imagination. This, within ethics, is probably a fairly self-explanatory idea. You have to imagine different futures and try to interpret what the moral impacts, the ethical impacts might be. The difficulty is that's pretty abstract. It's kind of a thought experiment. So I like the idea, and I've seen a uh, good success in teams now trying to create something more tangible to provoke that conversation, something that I call a provocotype. Uh, now this is easiest if I show an example of this. This is uh, a great piece of design done by Marcel Schoenar and Harm van Beek for two Dutch energy clients. And the scenario that they've been asked to illustrate with this provocotype is a scarce energy future, which is highly likely, a future of electric vehicles and public charging points also highly likely. And the question is, how would a system allocate these scarce resources where there's more demand than there is supply? So they built this provocotype. And it's, you know, it's a large, it's a large machine. And it comes with these plugs at the bottom. They are actually included that, you know, charging points within the provocotype. And so you pick one up, you plug it in into a free socket. You then have an ID card, which you tap on the reader above it to authenticate, to ID yourself with a system. And then you use the dials above it to request more or less energy or later or sooner or whatever it may be. And the system, the algorithm does the rest. So above it, you see a display of essentially how the algorithm has concluded it will apportion the energy over the coming hours. So we start right at the bottom, blue and red are being charged. Later on, blue will get the whole lot. After that, it's green's turn. So we're moving up as time goes on. You'll also see on the fringes there with the, with the dot display, Sometimes there's less energy bandwidth, if you like, and sometimes there's plenty of it. That's to illustrate, essentially, the differing amount of energy that's going to be available at certain points of the day. So this system essentially exposes what an algorithmically driven decision might look like in the practical world. But the most interesting part about this for me is they prototype the ID cards as well, the thing you tap to authenticate with the system. So these cards that we see here, they allocate different social status and different energy status. So we have a doctor in the middle. As a doctor, you have top priority within this system. However, there's a caveat, right? And in red, it says, um, you know, misuse will be punished by law. So there's some kind of legal threat that goes with it. Underneath it, we have a, a probation ID. This is presumably for a, a recent offender. Their energy use is capped. It's the lowest priority of the lot. So we see how social status and potential inequality becomes encoded and reinforced through the IoT and through energy scarcity. Now, the designers aren't proposing this as the best solution. They're not saying this is what public charging infrastructure should necessarily look like. They're using this provocotype, as I call it, to provoke the conversations that matter. It's an artifact that almost creates this strange wormhole between design and research. So I think this kind of work is terrifically important to stimulate that moral imagination so that we can make more informed decisions. But of course, it takes time. We need to have the time and the space for this divergence to happen, um, something that tech companies don't always provide. So I think we need to start pushing for it as part of our natural process. Within the design phase itself, as I've mentioned, a lot of the ethical challenges in tech come from the invisibility uh, that it often has, whether it's intentional or otherwise. And so I think there's a, an important opportunity to shift data flows, persuasion, things like that, into the visible spectrum so that people can make more informed decisions. Probably the best example in uh, consumer 
uh, product is, is this is the, the Prius Energy Monitor. I'm sure some of you recognize it. I think this is quite an old version. Um, I think this is fantastic design because what it does is it um, helps to depict this abstract concept, energy flow, within a vehicle. It's a complex system, nicely simplified through design, but it allows the driver to change their driving style and their habits to get the best out of the system, to hopefully get it to act in a way that conserves energy or that um, responds in a more ethically responsible way, perhaps. So by materialising the previously invisible, this flow of energy within a system, people can act in more sustainable ways. Here's my example of how this might look for, say, a hypothetical home hub. If I've got something like, you know, like a bit like a Nest or the iOS Home app or um, perhaps is it the Echo Look or Echo Show, I never remember which, um, that, you know, the Echo that can link your home, uh, your home network together. Let's say we have a system that gathers data about your habits, your viewing, your biometrics and so on, with consent, let's say, and passes some of it to advertisers in exchange for this being a cheap product or free or something like that. This is my attempt to depict how we could have a similar overview of the data flows within that system. So this allows for uh, informed consent of what's happening. It also allows for correction. If I say, well, hang on, I actually don't want you to have this information. I'm assuming we can now tap on this and swipe it away and say, actually, be gone. We're going to break that connection there. So I think this is a step toward more informed consent and more informed exchange of data for valuable technology. I think we also need to take steps towards occasionally increasing the friction, making technologies that no longer recede into the background, but actually intervene in people's experiences and almost get in the way, sometimes making me think. So here's, again, a hypothetical, there's a modal interface for the same home hub. And it's asking for some fairly personal data, I think, heart rate, location, I think that uh, is a decision the user shouldn't be taking lightly. I think the user also should be informed that any data, even if it's de-identified or if it's anonymized, there's always a risk that in future that can be unpicked with different data sets to correlate or different algorithms to process that data. So the user should be informed of that risk. And I'm choosing here to contradict some fundamental user uh, experience principles by making it more difficult to say yes. So I'm actually insisting that the user takes a stylus or their finger and actually writes the words, I agree, within this interface. I think there's also ethical theory that we can draw upon. One of these, uh, one of these ideas is what's called the veil of ignorance. This comes from the philosopher John Rawls, who wrote a book, A Theory of Justice. And the idea of the uh, veil of ignorance is essentially that the fairest system is one designed as if we are behind this veil, not knowing our ultimate place within the system. So let's say I'm designing a welfare system. A fair welfare system would be one that, no matter what hand I was dealt, whether I was a welfare recipient, an administrator of the scheme, or a taxpayer, that I would regard the system as fair. So this might be a useful technique when designing technological systems as well, designing them as if we could be put in any number of positions within that ecosystem. Critique is obviously a terribly important part of the process when it comes to discussing our ethical responsibilities. I think a healthy critique process is a large part of the battle won. One thing we can do here is to employ what's sometimes called a designated dissenter. This is an idea that comes from Eric Meyer and Sarah Wachtebecher. They wrote a book called Design for Real Life. And this role is essentially a role of constructive antagonism someone whose job it is to kind of lob in a grenade of defiance every now and then and say, what if I don't want to provide the information you're requesting? What if I'm going through an emotionally difficult time, for example, you're asking for my marital status and I'm going through a messy breakup or a divorce, how dare you ask for this information? So it's this role to challenge and subvert some of the assumptions that a tech team has made. Um, now, Dr. Betcher and Maya suggest, and I agree, that this role needs to be rotated, right? You don't want, have, you don't want to have someone doing this for an entire year. Um, it'll start to sour their perceptions and they'll start to get rather ignored. But I think it's a powerful way to introduce those constructive challenges into the design process. I also think there's a, uh, an opportunity here to draw on a little bit more ethical theory, something I call the four ethical tests. So my attempt here is to try and 
draw on the three main schools of modern ethics and translate them into practical questions that tech teams can ask, them, ask themselves. So this is about as theoretical as, as I'll get, so please bear with me. Um, the first question I'll suggest is, what if everyone did what I'm about to do? Would a world in which this decision or this law of behaviour, if you like, where that was universal, would that be a better place or a worse place? And this comes from Immanuel Kant. This is what's known in ethics as a deontological uh, view on ethics. A deontologist is someone who believes in what's morally right to do. There are certain laws that should govern our behaviour. People have certain rights, for instance. So let's have a look at this question in the context of a dark pattern, a deceptive interface. If I've got someone on my team trying to persuade me to ship a dark pattern, well, I can ask this question. If we all put deceptive interfaces in our products, then the sphere of technology is diminished. In fact, probably our lives are that little bit worse. So according to this question, I don't think that's a healthy uh, world, and that's something that I'm going to reject. Also from Kant, another question that, that he poses essentially comes down to, am I, am I treating people as ends or as means? This takes maybe a little bit of unpacking. In the world of technology and design, this is mostly about our users. Are we treating them as means for me to hit my own targets? Or am I treating them as a free individual with their own goals, which are perhaps more important than my own? This is a question I think that most individuals don't really have a problem with. We all recognise the idea of our users as independent, uh, autonomous people. But I find in some large, say, data-driven organisations, this is a question that starts to get a little bit more challenging. Because in these organisations, sometimes the way we see users shifts subtly with time. They become not the raison d'etre, not the reason that we're here, but they become means for us to hit our own targets. Essentially, people become masses. And when that happens, unethical design is, I think, the natural result. The third ethical test uh, that I can offer is um, what's known as a utilitarian perspective on ethics. Am I maximizing happiness for the greatest number of people? And by extension, am I minimizing suffering, minimizing harm? And this utilitarian question is, is really about the impact, the consequences of our decisions. So a utilitarian doesn't really care so much about the morally correct way to behave. They're not going to draw up a list of, of moral rules. Instead, they'll look at what the actual consequences, the impact of their choices is. Now, this to the tech industry is often seen quite you know, as a promising avenue because this feels slightly measurable, right? I can put people in brain scanners. I can do the galvanic skin response stuff. I can get their net promoter scores. I can see their eventual behaviors on our platforms. So this feels slightly appealing, but it also has some downsides. As a, as a way of thinking about morality, um, are we really expected to do this for every single decision? Does this not turn us into number crunchers rather than living, breathing people? And it also struggles with what's sometimes called the tyranny of the majority. If I have um, a population, 99% of whom want to exile or execute a 1% minority, if I'm a utilitarian, that can be a, a slightly hard thing to, to combat with this lens. The fourth and final ethical test I'll offer is grounded in the final school, the third school of modern ethics, which is called virtue ethics. And the question is, would I be happy for this to be a front page story? The virtue ethicists don't care so much about rules or outcomes, unlike their, their deontological and uh, utilitarian counterparts. They're really interested in moral character. What does this say about me as an individual? What values, what virtues am I trying to live by? So this question really for me is about accountability. Is this a decision that I'm happy to sign my name to? Would it be okay if it was a push notification sent to all my friends and family? And the downside I think of this way of thinking though is you're really acting only out of a fear of embarrassment. This is, you know, I'm not behaving in a certain way because other people might criticize my character, say I'm a bad person for doing it. That feels like fairly shaky grounds for proper moral behavior. Finally, of course, there is a role for, uh, for testing, for checking the work that we've done and seeing whether it actually has the effects that we're hoping it does. Kate Crawford, who's an academic and um, also works uh, with Microsoft Research, talks about fairness forensics. She has a, uh, an excellent 
talk at the um, NIPS conference, which you might want to look up. Um, and it's a, a system of approaches that can be used to try and uh, interrogate the bias that maybe sits within our data, within our systems, within our algorithms, and to try and mitigate that bias where possible. But I'm also a, a huge fan of trying to pair these analytical approaches with more qualitative approaches. Conducting deep research with perhaps some of the most vulnerable groups within our systems. As I mentioned at the start, tech and humanity tend to sort of interweave, so unfortunately it often happens that the harms of technology fall upon society's most vulnerable groups anyway. So I think teams have a duty to talk to these people, to reach out to activists uh, from these groups, and also very carefully to talk with people who have undergone these harms, who have experienced them uh, for themselves, understanding their lived experiences and trying to negotiate their needs better within that system. Underpinning it all is an idea that I would call ethical infrastructure, trying to build a company's capability um, and resilience for emotional, uh, sorry, for ethical uh, questions. One important step, I think, is to hire diverse teams. Diverse teams really are a, kind of an ethical early warning system, if you like. I've been in conversations where representatives who are, you know, uh, from different groups, different backgrounds, different experiences than other people on the team have raised their hand and said, well, do you realise that the decision we're about to take is actually going to have this effect for this group of people? And of course, no, they didn't realise that. So the interplay between people with inherent and acquired diversities, the, the, the mix that we can bring to the table, I think, builds our capabilities to anticipate these emotional, uh, these ethical uh, harms. I think it's important for leaders within uh, the tech industry to recognise right behaviours, moral behaviours, and try to reward them. Make sure that career ladders, for instance, actually talk about what is the ethical behaviour we expect of someone uh, moving into management, say, or someone moving into a senior position. How should they behave? And then using those criteria to assess promotion, hiring, even firing decisions. Rewarding the right behaviours, not just the right results. One way to help concretize that is to uh, create a system of core values for the organization to say this is what we believe as a company this is how we essentially resolve ethical quandaries we can refer back to our agreed set of values and use those as a guiding star for our decisions but of course ultimately the responsibility is something we have to take on as individuals as technologists as practitioners I think morality isn't some gift. I don't think it's a natural trait. I think it's a muscle that needs exercise. I think we have to, when the time is right, ask ourselves, ask ourselves you know, uncomfortable, difficult questions. How might I be screwing up right now in my work? What's my preferred way of looking at ethics, referring back, say, to the three um, ethical lenses and the four ethical tests that I mentioned? What will my limit be? Where would I draw the line and say, I'm not prepared to go past this? And then how would I handle that? How would I have that conversation with my teammates, with my manager? Ultimately, if it's safe to do so, I think uh, the choice to live a more ethical life is about increasing the risk that we bear individually. Now, that's a privileged position. I recognise not everyone has that um, safety and comfort to be able to stand up for what they believe to be right. I don't think we should judge others too harshly for failing to do that. We don't know their individual circumstances. But I would say if you feel comfortable and safe and respected in your positions or future positions as technologists, as designers, then you are in a perfect position to use up a little bit of that goodwill to stand up for what you believe to be the morally correct thing to do. And that act of standing up, that act of disobedience, doesn't need to be purely sort of obstinate and aggressive. There can be a role for that. But there are also more gentle ways to subvert some of these decisions, to say, I'm not entirely comfortable with the way this is heading. Have we considered using ethics as, as I say, a constraint, as a seed of innovation, and trying an alternative uh, approach? I also think, just to close out, that this journey requires patience, it requires um, forgiveness, to be honest, on ourselves as well. Self-care is important on this journey. Um, the choice to try and take ethics more seriously, I can tell you from experience, not necessarily 
uh, a happy one, not necessarily an easy one. It can be difficult, it can be emotionally draining at times. It's, it becomes quite easy to punish yourself for the mistakes that you make just as much as uh, you are a critic of others. The good news is I think choosing to take these decisions seriously will also help you get a bit closer to the kind of person that you want to become. For that, it's terrifically important we also draw from each other. Given the challenges of the future and all the ways that we could go wrong with emerging technology, I think we're going to need all the thoughtful technologists that we can get. People who care enough to make a difference in this crucial industry and to navigate together toward better futures. I really dearly hope that, of course, you will choose to be one of those people. Thanks for your time. Thank <laughs> you.